Hello, good morning, everyone. So welcome to the summer school. My name is Jin Chou, and I'm a postdoc in Jürgen's group. So first, we want to start with this presentation because as Jürgen already showed, not everyone is a beginner. But not everyone is very experienced in proteomics, but we also noticed that more than half of you are not beginners. So before we move, so before we move to the more advanced presentations, probably a lot of people already know most of the things I'm going to talk about. But be patient. We want people who are not so experienced to enjoy the summer school as much as these uh, experienced participants. So. I will start with the introduction of proteomics. So first of all, proteins are biological molecules that's made up of more one or more chains of amino acids. Then proteome is, of course, the entire complement of proteins, including the modification made to a given set of proteins produced by an organism or cell systems and Proteomics is the large scale study of the proteome. Here you can see a, a peptide chain consists of amino acids. And why we study proteomics and what is what are the advantages of proteomics? So first of all, proteins are the function units in cells. And the Proteins are more dynamic than DNA or RNA, and they reflect the actual biological changes in response to stimuli or environmental conditions. Last, proteomics can also identify the presence of specific protein isoforms and post-translational modifications that can affect protein functions, which you cannot do this by at the DNA or RNA level. So we start with the sample. So first of all, proteins are extracted from the material. It can be plasma, cells, feces, and even water and soil. Then if you measure the example, uh, extracted proteins directly, it's called top-down proteomics, which is very complex and has some unsolved challenges at the moment, so we're not going to talk about it in our summer school, and we will focus on the next workflow, bottom-up proteomics. So for bottom-up proteomics, where the proteins are first uh, coded by the uh, proteins into peptides, and then if we just measure them directly, we can do label-free quantification, and Carlo will give a presentation about label-free quantification later today. And we can also label them with isobaric labeling, and Pelly is giving another talk later today. So now we have mixed peptides from samples, and I believe everyone agrees that biological samples are very complex. And like in this picture, at the first glance, you you can barely identify any character. The information is just overwhelming. And how about now? We separate them first, so it's much easier to identify each one. And this is what we are going to do with mass spectrometry-based proteomics. So to start with the separation, we first inject our samples into HPLC. So what is HPLC? HPLC is an analytical chemistry technique used to separate each component from the mixture. And there are two phases in HPLC, the mobile phase and the stationary phase. So for proteomics study, the C18 column is commonly used as the stationary phase for peptide separation because peptides are typically have uh, peptides typically have hydrophobic regions that can interact with C18 columns through the through van der Waals force, and peptides that are more uh, highly polar tend to have less interaction with the column. So they move faster than non-polar peptides. 
and also the hydrophobic interactions between the peptides and the colon can be adjusted by changing the composition of the mobile phase. As you increase increase the uh, ratio of the organic phase, the 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 interaction between the peptides and the colon will become weaker. So it can move faster and flushed out. That's how peptides, basically how peptides are separated by HPLC based on their chemical properties. So in proteomics studies, we run normally run a gradient by changing the composition of mixed solvent. Usually we start with a low uh, organic, uh, organic solvent ratio, then gradually increase the ratio and at the end decrease it to make sure we flush out everything. And now peptides are separated and it's way better than the original peptide mixture, but still it's not good enough. At the same, at the same time point, you will still have a lot of peptides. So we will need another instrument to further separate and detect the peptides, the mass spectrometer. And so one of the first important contributions to the development of mass spectrometry was made by Hendrik Lawrence. He derived the Lorentz force, which described the combined electric and magnetic sphere, uh, magnetic uh, forces acting on a charged molecules in a magnetic field. So this F is for force, that is for charge, number of charges, E and B stands for electric and magnetic fields, and the V is the velocity. And also at the same time, we also have Newton's second law. So F is force, M is mass, and A is acceleration. If we combine these two equations and remove the F, we can get an equation like this. So this combined equation is a classical uh, equation of the motion of charged molecules. So from this equation, you can see that you can calculate the mass to charge ratio, uh, M over Z, but uh, from the motion of the charged molecules, velocity and acceleration, a, for a given electric and magnetic fields, we have E and B, you can set it to certain value. So based on this equation, Francis Williams Aston and JJ Thompson, they invented the very first mass spectrometer based on this. And from this equation, you can also see why we're talking about M over Z all the time in proteomics instead of just mass or charge. So the mass spectrometry is an analytical technique that is used to measure M over Z of the ions. So first, the peptide solutions of the HPLC is ionized and becomes gas phase in the ion source. Then it goes to the key part, mass analyzer. And here I'm going to introduce some classic mass analyzer. First, I will start with TOF. And TOF is short for time of flight. It has a very simple mechanism. As the name suggests, it measures the time of flight of ions. This picture shows the structure of a TOF and this reflectron, this reflection, this part, it's a uh, it doubled the distance that the molecule traveled to increase the sensitivity and also reduce the size of the mass analyzer. But still, if you ever worked with a TOF like TeamSoft, most of them have a very big head. And the advantage of the TOF is it, it has very fast data acquisition and high sensitivity. But on the other hand, it has slightly lower mass resolution compared with the Orbitrap mass analyzer, which I will introduce later. 
And also in recent years, it's popular, it's very popular to couple the ion mobility spectrometry we, together with the TOF to add an extra step to separate the molecules like team's TOF. So here, ions are prop propelled through a tunnel by a gas flow and at the same time, an electrical uh, an electrical field controls each ions from moving uh, beyond a, a position defined by the ions mobility, where the push where push it experiences from the gas flow matches uh, the force of the electrical field. Ramping down the electrical field allows selectively releasing ions from the tunnel according to their mobility. One extra separation it works very well. And now I'm going to introduce another very popular mass analyzer Orbitrap. It's a method of mass spectrometry in which the m over z of a uh, iron is not determined by the this travel distance, but is determined by the frequency of of harmonic iron uh, oscillations oscillations alongside the axis of the field. So, uh, in Orbitrap, it has a very special electric field. So these molecules will spin and they are separated. Uh, they are separated uh, based on their mm, they are spin and separated uh, between the outer electrode and also the central spindle. As uh, ions spin, their motion generates a uh, image currents that detected by the outer by the outer electrode. So the image currents are further converted to mass spectral by Fourier transform. So compared with the TOF, the Orbitrap it has very high mass resolution and also mass accuracy, but the data acquisition is relatively slower. So earlier this month in ASMS, some official there introduced a new mass spectrometer that some of you may have heard of it the Orbitra Pastro, they claim that this mass spec has both very high mass resolution and very fast data acquisition. So how did they do that? As you can see from the picture, it has an Orbitrap mass analyzer here and another Astro analyzer here. So they use the Orbitrap for high dynamic range and high resolution measurements. Basically, they use it for the full scan measurement, and they use another new astro analyzer. It's short for asymmetric track lossless and analyzer for fast and sensitive measurements. But probably you can see that it's quite similar to the TOF mass analyzer. So it's not hard to imagine that why they can have the advantage of the of both analyzer. And also you can expect that the raw data is a bit different from other existing raw data. It's kind of like a combination of Orbitrap and TOF data. So as Jürgen already mentioned, we are going to optimize MaxQuant and it will be fully supported in the next version of MaxQuant. Okay, we move on. So now <clears throat> we get Spectrum from the from the mass analyzer and after mass analyzer the charged peptide peptides were detected as spectrum and for a specific retention time we have a spectrum containing the information of m over z and also the intensity so let's say in a very ideal situation we get a perfect separation and only one kind of peptide goes to the director will we get only one peak no, first of all, all the elements have isotopes. So here you can see the ratio of natural isotopes for the for carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. These are three basic elements for proteins. And especially for carbon, there's about 1% C13, which is about one Dalton heavier than C12. So as a result of C13, 
isotope, you would expect to see a spectrum like this. So with multiple peaks contain, containing different amounts of C13 and with a distance uh, almost equal to one. And it's not hard to imagine that there will be more and more intense isotopic peaks if the peptide has a lot of carbon. So what else? So during the ionization, the peptides can be multi-charged instead of just charge one. According to this formula, remember this super important M over Z here. So Z stands for the number of charges. So can, you can see a lot of peaks are created because of multiple charges. When, let's say here, when there's charge two, the distance between the peaks, they will create some peaks that has a distance of 0 0.5 instead of one. And also for charge three, you have peaks, isotopic peaks with distance 0 0.333 instead of one. So it's not that easy to interpret the peptide spectra like you might think, as you might think, and even in a very, very ideal situation. So what do we do? I think most of us have the experience of solving some complex tasks. So when something is very complex, sometimes we just split them into different simple parts. And when we finish the split simple parts, the complex part is also finished. So researchers have the same thinking of the peptide spectrum, which we also call it MS1 spectra. So they add another fragmentation step to select ions of a particular M, uh, of a particular M over D com coming from the MS1 spectra and then make them split into sm uh, smaller frequent ions and match other spectrum. So, and this new fragment spectrum is called MS2 spectrum, or sometimes we call them MS, MS spectrum. So now we can further extend our scheme with MS2 part, but if we're going back to this figure, you might think, how should we select the uh, ions from the MS1 spectrum? So randomly pick some, maybe it's not a good idea. So there are two ways to select peaks uh, for MS1 spectrum. The first one is a very classic one, and we call it data dependent acquisition, DDA. So for this figure, it's basically the extension of MS1 collected all through the retention time. So it's like a 3D plot instead of 2D plot. And for the, the selected picks are depends on the data itself for DDA uh, acquisition. For example, the pep people might be more interested in this intense picks and believe this low intense peaks might be the background noise. So we can just focus on the high inten intense piece. For example, in this picture, we can just pick the top three most intense peaks from the MS1 spectrum and, and create the MS2 spectrum from them. And for DDA analysis, you can imagine that the raw data is relatively small and simple because we only collect part of the information instead of all of them. And also we use very small windows to collect the information. However, some people might not agree that these low intense peaks are not that important. They instead collect all the information from the MS1 spectra and here we call this data independent acquisition. So no matter how intense your peak is, they just take all the peaks and use very wide windows to capture all the peaks from the MS1 spectrum. And no pain, no gain. You capture all the information, but at the same time, the raw data is relatively bigger than the DDA acquisition and also it's more complex to analyze.
So here is a 2D plot that shows the windows of DDA, DIA, and targeted analysis for the 3D plot uh, seen from above. And the first one is uh, DDA acquisition. You can see that we just use some we just use some small windows to pick certain intense peaks from the MS1 spectrum. And also for most of our summer school, we will spend a lot of time to talk about DDA acquisition. But for DIA acquisition, we also have some special slots. Like on Tuesday, tomorrow, Jorgen will spend three slots to introduce a max DIA algorithm, how we deal with the DIA data. And also here, there is another strategy that I haven't introduced. It's targeted analysis. So basically for some researchers, they're very especially interested in certain proteins, for example, some proteins or enzymes from certain disease pathways. So in this case, they just target and set special M over D parameters for these proteins. And for targeted analysis, we also have a slot on Wednesday. So Christoph will give a presentation to introduce the Max Bond Live, how we use this for targeted analysis. So at the end, we are all set. We start with our samples, we extract peptides and the peptides goes to the HPLC MS and also mass spectrometer, it gets separated. At the end, we got raw data, which are the mass spectra. And what can we do with this raw data? So we can use them to answer some basic questions. For example, which proteins can we identify in our samples? And what are the differences between the samples? What are, what are the amounts of various proteins? And also, as I mentioned, are these proteins modified and they're modified on what amino acid position? So to answer all these basic questions, our group developed MaxQuant and Paseus. And for the rest of the summer school, we are going to show you how to use these two software to answer these questions and also these questions that you're interested in. So that's my part. Thank you very much.